Hey everybody, welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. My name's Colin Way and today it's all about the basket weave effect. And the only reason I'm showing you this is because we've got some cool new tools that I wanted to show off. Um, so if ever, any of you have saw or seen the webinar um, that I'd done with the guys at Easywood, you'll understand where we're going with this one. Um, so yes, instead of doing the conventional bowl though, because we've done a bowl a few months ago, I think I'd done a collaboration with Ben actually. Ben's behind the camera, everybody. Um, so Ben will be uh, ans asking your questions. You know the routine. And if you're new to the channel, um, the way it works is you type your questions into uh, the chat box and uh, Ben will see them and ask me and I'll um, I'll give you the answers if I know them. Um, but yeah, we've done a collaboration a few months back on making a little basket weave um, style bowl. I done the bowl um, and the beading and Ben done the decorating. This is all going to be done on the lathe. Well, I say it's going to be done on the lathe. It's all the prep's going to be done on the lathe. And then you go and sit in front of the TV, in front of the telly box one evening and start coloring in um, when you've got a spare five minutes. Um, so the project we're doing is a little vase. And the reason that I want to do a vase, especially if it's your first basket weave effect um, project, is that it's side grain. So it should be a bit easier. Saying that, I have, I've got two pieces of timber that I've been experimenting with. One's sycamore and one's birch. And regular sycamore, as long as it's quite dense, would work. This is a little bit punky, so it's a little bit soft, so there is a little bit of fracturing. So we're going to talk about how we or how we can sort of try and um, stop um, sort of chipping out and stuff like that. Um, but to be honest, it, the best timber for this, um, especially if you're going to color it in, will be something like a nice white hard maple. Um, that will hold an edge really, really well. Um, we're going to use sanding sealers, diluted sanding sealers, to help us um, prevent too much breakout, um, if possible. Um, but let's just have a look. So before we put decoration in, um, this is this is what we, we're going to get to. So it's a, a very, very simple vase shape. So we don't want any other um, sort of features in this apart from the beads that we're going to create here um you know, part of me likes that as a as a finish in itself and if you're just doing rims on bowls on vases that sort of thing three or four of these lines then you know you're halfway there um we're going to burn in the uh, radial lines with a wire burner these with wire burner and in this instance, and we have talked about creating these these burn lines before with with wooden wedges and things like that. Now, for me, the wooden wedge wouldn't work in this instance because we're using quite a small bead. Um, then that we would probably burn the sides of the beads as well, and we'd get for a lot of wedges before we got to the top. That's why, in this instance, I prefer the wire. Um, it's nice and thin. And with the easy wood wire burners, you can have different gauges to suit the project that you're doing, the size of bead that you're doing also. Um, even right down to pen making. If you wanted to do a few beads on the, um, the near the nib of the pen, you've got a nice small uh, wire to be able to burn things like pens as well. So, so yeah, that's, that's part of the process. Once we've done that, of course, we need to then create the vertical lines. And we're going to utilize the um, the indexing on our lathes to do that and a couple of little tricks I'm going to show you. So if we can just stay on that camera a second, Ben, I just want to show you then what you can do once you've done the um, vertical lines. So we've done our horizontal lines um, or sort of radial lines rather and then we create the vertical lines. We're going to do that with a pyrography pen and then it's up to you. And you can really see there where we get the idea of a basket weave effect. You're know, making your piece of timber look like a, a woven basket. Whichever culture you're following You've got good examples on the internet, whether it's an African, Aboriginal, North American Indian, all those sorts of, of cultures have fantastic um, uh, sort of um, representations of a basket weave bowl. There's lots of uh, inspiration um, that you can look at. That was just one I picked out of my head. It's a really uh, random um, set of, of markings there, leaving some of the, the little squares um, you know, as timber. That's timber. So, um, again, if we just hang on to that camera a minute, Ben, um, I have bought some pens um, to do this because I'm using a three mil, one eighth uh, bead or beading cutter, which we'll look at in a minute. I brought some fine nib pens. So these these little pens here, I purposely wanted to have something with an extra fine nib. Um, and as you can see, this is these are really really thin. If you were going to go to something like the three eight beading cutter. Um, then you could use the Chromacraft pens 
And so the chromacraft pens are the um, the die pens, or wood die pens, um, and they have a much bigger tip. You can see there, um, but it is a pointed tip. So for the three eight beads, that would work absolutely fine. Um, but it's just these little tiny one eighth is not uh, not quite small enough. So let's have a look at the cutters. I'm using the the MIDI um, the mini tool here, and on that. Oh, which one are we going to do better? <laughs> um, on that, I've got the little one-eighth um, cutter. Let's just try and get them nice and close if I can. And in the little bag there, you can just see I've got the other four, sorry, the other three cutters that make up the set of four. Um, so we've starting with a one-eighth. We then go to three-sixteenth, a one-quarter, and a three-eighth. Okay, I'll let you do the working out. at three mil, four, six, and 10. I, know about that. I think that's about right anyway. But there we are. Um, they're little carbide cutters and um, and uh, uh, really, really quite sharp. And you can see how fine that, that little one eighth one is. So perfect for this sort of thing. So our first job, for what we've got to do to start with, um, really, is shape the vase. So um, I've just held it between centers. Like I say, this is a piece of this. Sycamore. I mean, you can see, I don't know whether the camera can pick that up, but you can see how fairly woolly that is. We're just going to run with it, you know. Um, give me a bit of slack if it does chip a little bit. We've spoken about what timbers work best. So I'm going to turn the lathe down to zero and turn the lathe on. We're then going to turn this um, this vase shape. Well, to start with, of course, I need to um, create a hole point for my chuck because we're going to turn most of this project off of a chuck. Um, and I'm using the SK100 here with uh, the 112 um uh, jaws so the old donald 112 now i know we are skipping around metric and imperial an awful lot it's just woodworking it's the way things are i'm afraid um, country of origin is one one thing so these have always been known from uh, when when uh, the uk was back in imperial as 112s inch and a half internal measurement um you can all do the math on on that one but that's what i want to do and the reason i want to use that one is because it's going to throw the project away from the chuck because i want to get behind the back of it um, with this beading tool. Um, so it's my best choice of chuck for that one. Yes, Ben, questions? Um, so question here from Jim B. Cohen. Um, will those cutters fit in all the easy wood handles? Um, and so uh, one question I didn't research. They won't fit in all the easy wood handles. No, they will cut, um, fit in the rougher. Um, and it's the from the mid-size down uh, is what they're going to fit in. They won't, and I'm going to... I'm going to stick my neck out here, and I don't think they fit on the the, the smallest ones. But I'm I'd have to double check on that. Um, but certainly the mini and the 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 mid size, yes, they will. Um, but the rougher only because the, the easywood tools are shaped. So we have the finisher will have a round um, holder, and the detail will have that diamond holder, and that just gives us cutters rigidity. Really, it gives you maximum support. So the roughers only from mini from medium downwards okay this one's the mini um okay and hi jim by the way um thank you for that one let's turn the lathe back on we're going to go and rough this down at around about 1600 revs with a roughing gouge There we are. I'm not overly fussed because we're going to take this off the lathe, hold it in a chuck, um, you know, take it off the lathe basically. Every time you do that, you're going to cause an issue in terms of um, con concentricity. Um, so I'm not worried about roughing it down to a certain point apart from round instead of square. This is really punky. I'm probably setting myself up here. Um, but anyway, let's crack on. Let's measure that chuck. And we'll put a little foot. It's going to be a dovetailed foot in this case because uh, the inner part of my O'Donnell jaws are, are dovetailed. So I'm measuring the optimum size, which is where it said it's true circle. I'm going to cut that in, firstly with a beading and parting tool.
So I'm just waiting until I get close to the dividers. Sorry, calipers. There we are, and we're over. I'll make that a little bit bigger now. Remember, this is quite a soft, punky timber. Okay, so we're at the right diameter. So what I'll do now is just clean up the underside. We've got to make sure any surface, any bearing surface that comes into contact with the chuck is clean. Because if it isn't, it'll be thrown off of center. So there we are, down nice and nice and small there. And then I'll just go for a, a nice skew here, side scrape. Just to create that little dovetail. Now, if you're going to do a few of these, in fact, if you're doing a vase in general, get everything to this, this dimension um, and this prep before you dismantle everything. Um, and mount your chuck. So the pro drive can come away now. Put that to one side. There we are. So that's our one SK100. Got a little OD jaws. Make sure we're not two all over the place every time you scrunch that timber you're putting it slightly out of center um, but we're going to use the tail stock the tail stock may as well be used because we can use it why don't we so let's bring the tail stock up um, i'm going to go for a slightly smaller tool rest and let's get a, a half decent finish on that that timber before we start so two options here. Let's lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on and up the speed. I'm just going to skim or create a skew cut first with a bowl gouge. And that's also um, taking it down to a nice even round again. So uh, when I say a skew cut, it's, it's also known as a shear cut. Basically, the bevel's rubbing and the cutting edge is being presented just like you would a skew. Of course, you can use a skew chisel if you want to. Let's just check out the finish. That's slightly better, isn't it? M much, much better, that. Um, so whilst I'm here, I'll just clean up and trim up an edge. And now we can start thinking about shape. So I need to remove a lot of the neck first. So let's rough that out. There we are. I'm just going to put a very slight relief on that top edge. Now we can start taking more bulk away. So I'm going to start at the neck, thinnest area, a little bit at a time. And now my reverse curve, so my shoulder. It's just all bowl gouge at the moment. Let's go to a smaller gouge. So that was a 3.8. If I go to the little quarter inch, Go down to a six mil and drop the Taurus. Taurus is too high. Ben, if if I'm not watching and um, you have questions, just give me a, give me a shout and I'll stop. <laughs> Go for it. <clears throat> so Robert Richards is asking, uh, he says, Colin, you know you love your signature skew, but is there any real difference between an oval skew and a rectangular skew beside the shape? Right, let's have a... Just 
Just finish that curve. Stop the lathe. Is there a difference between a rectangular skew and an oval skew? That's the question. There is a big difference between an oval and a rectangular. If you have the two in your hand and use them, you'll see um, a lot of oval skews come with a very acute angle. So right the way back, sometimes to 15 degrees. Now, the, the more acute the angle, the more aggressive the tool can become. You get a nicer finish but you will get a very aggressive chisel. So if you're unsure about the skew, starting with an angle like that is going to cause you problems. Um, that's the reason for things like beading and parting tools um, being there. Um, they're much less of an angle. Um, so you compromise finish for ease of use. And that's what we're doing with um, with my skews. I'm tending to put a 25 degree bevel angle on instead of that that. Um, harsh 15. Some of the standards, again, same thing. Now, as you get more proficient with the skew chisel, and a lot, you'll see a lot of professionals do this, they'll bring their angle, their given angle, back and get finer and finer and finer. So your finish is much, much better. You can get into far um, tighter spaces. Um, but like I said, they will be a little bit more, well, a lot more aggressive the further back you go. So that's the, that's the main difference, yeah. Um, right, so that's the neck. Let's go down to uh, the back of our vase. So again, we're just going to remove waste. So this is just a, a roughing cut. Now I'm going to turn the gouge over. I'm going to use the bevel and the back of the, the gouge. And I'm going to slide that bevel along the timber. absolutely no different than you would do on the inside or outside of a bowl so let's turn that speed up a little and all round there's my contact and stop now that's the rough shape i want to give myself an idea where this is going to end so we're going to go with a, a parting tool now And eventually, when we've done everything on this piece, we're going to part off. Yeah. We'll stop and double check. So I really want that finish at this stage. We're going to sand it next. I really want the finish to be a good one. Think about, and this is something that I've said quite often, you know, if you're doing a table leg or chair leg or anything like that, the reason that we start off with a really nice um, uh, smooth surface is because that surface will be the high points of all of your details. So beads and um, um, and V-cuts, sort of uh, fillets, all those things, um, they can be that maximum diameter. And if they're not a good finish when you start, they're not going to be a good finish when you end. Um, yes, admittedly, coves and things like that, you'll take them down and, um, you know, change the surface. But the high spots, you won't. So we now have to sand, and we're going to put a sanding sealer on this as well. And we're, we're probably sanding seals several times throughout this process now, just to keep, try and harden that timber up a little bit. So tool rest can come out of the way. All good for the moment, Ben, before I start the extractor. Um, so we're going to start with 100 grit. We're going to work our way through. We're going to go 100, um, 150, 240. I don't need to go ultra fine because this is not going to be the finished surface, remember. Um, this is going to be beaded. All I'm trying to do with this is make that surface clean. I don't have to have it scratch free. That's the difference. Go. Now, before I go any further with the abrasive, I'm going to stop the, the lathe and I want to check, have I got rid of any tears that may have been in there? If I have, then I, I'm free to go up through the grits. So that was a 100. So we're going to move on to 150. If I can find it. 
150. And I'm actually sanding this top corner over as well. This is going to be another bead, or maybe another bead. The, the reason I say that, we're not going to start at the edges. We're going to start in the center and work our way out. Radiate out to the edges and trim back to the nearest bead. There we go. So that was 150, so finally 240, and then we'll seal. Yeah, that's fine. Happy with that. So we're not, like I say, we're not sanding to a to a finish. We're sanding to a surface. And condition so there are a few scratches there that's not an issue for me at all at this stage um you can see a little you, these green i don't know whether the camera can pick these up these marks here they're, they're green um or slightly green marks they're, they're start of decay they're start of that spalting and so it's not perfect for this but what we've got that's what we're going to use and you're going to be in the same position it's what you have so sanding cedar I've got a 50-50 mix. I want this to soak in a long way. That's why it's diluted. There's, there's, the reason that I dilute all of my sealers is because I want them to soak in. Yes, uh, Ben. Um, so a question here um, from Jim. I think he's got the same lathe, the 406. Um, he's asking, uh, what is the purpose of the threaded hole on the, the inside of the tailstock? He's only recently found his. This, uh, I'm get in the inside of the tail stock. Hmm. He says, um, uh, on the the backside or the inside of the tail stock. Well, there is a um, um, a lead screw on the inside. It might be that one. So you've got this part of the quill. You've got a uh, it's a female uh, thread in there, and you've got a male version on the, on the back of the hand or inside the hand. Well, that's what that's locking into. So they thread together. So it might be that you're seeing, maybe. So look, I've, I've given it, whilst I've been waffling, I've been allowing that to soak into that timber, I'm not rushing the process too much. Um, just making sure that soaks in a nice long way. That's really going to help harden the timber up um before we start beading so the cutters that we're using want to cut on the halfway point the mid section so before you start doing anything just double check am i cutting center a bit high there there we are that looks better okay and you can see my cutter okay we're literally going to start here and then i'm going to work out to the top and work down to the bottom and radiate outwards. So I think that sealer is dry enough to start working. Um, if you're unsure about that, stand on one side because we need to get this up quite quick now. I'm going to be up to 2,000 revs. That's how fast I prefer to go. Um, and the, um, the scraper is horizontal. So you're not lifting the handle, you're dead level. And approach nice and gentle to start with. Rock it back and forward if you want to go a little bit deeper. Next one. Let's pop some extraction on a minute. It's quite a therapeutic little job, this one. I quite enjoy this. Little wiggle. And I'm looking 
for the top of the bead to hit the bottom of the, um, the beading cutter. And just looking for that little shaving or that little bit of dust to occur. And I'm sort of, I'm being quite delicate with this, I don't want to bully the cut, but if you do that you'll end up chipping the timber away, especially on this really soft stuff. So what I'm going to do for I'm going to feed the whole of this one, I'm not going to burn the whole of it, we're going to just use this as an experiment just to show you where we get the various actions. And I want to show you what I mean about the rim or the very top of this, this vase. When I said about beading the top over. I'll come to you in a sec, Ben. What I'm doing, I'm just angling the cutter to the surface of the project. I want to be wherever possible, cutting at 90 degrees. So I'm going to make a little half cut. And then we'll come around the top of this one. There we are. So we've just rounded that over nicely there now. So let's carry on with the bottom. This is what I mean out here. I don't want to press hard. Like I say, if I press hard, I'll start chipping. And if you're finding that no matter what you do, no matter how delicate you are, you're getting chipping, do half the cut, say like that, more sanding sealer, dry it out and do the rest of the cut. Just to get that sanding sealer really deep into that grain. Right, that's the last bead. Before we move on from that section, I'm just going to now trim back to that bead with a parting tool. There we are. So you can see the last bead is the last one that I formed. There we are. We'll stop the dust extraction. We'll answer some questions now before we start burning. And I'll stop the lathe just to see how well that sanding sealer has helped us out. So there's a little bit of chipping, not as much as I was expecting though. That's been, that's really good. I'm happy with that. That's good. Uh, ben, yeah, questions. Okay, so we've got a few questions coming, Colwyn. Um, first one uh, from Jonathan. What's the size of the bead? That is one eighth. So I'm using the small one eighth cutter. Okay, the cutters that I'm using here go up um, from one eighth, three sixteenths, uh, quarter inch, and then three eighths. Oh, sorry. There was another one from Jim here. He's saying about um, if you look up through the backside of the tailstock, um, he's got that same lathe, um, the, the threaded section there. Some uh, some people might say it might be like a locking thread or a keyway type thing. Yeah, um, I, it might be. I can't see it at the moment because I'm blocking the entrance, yeah. so I won't be able <laughs> to see anything. But yeah, uh, I I don't know. Is the, is my honest answer? Um, a question from Fuller. Speaking of spalting, um, can spalted wood be stabilised by instilling a wood hardener under pressure? 
Yeah, absolutely. You'll see a lot of stabilized pen blanks, for instance, that you can buy um, and very soft, punky timbers that normally wouldn't you wouldn't be able to turn. Um, but yeah, by uh, using vacuum, um, you can sort of suck in that uh, that resin so things like cactus juice that, that's the sort of resin that they would use um, to stabilize uh, pens and, and softer materials right down to things like corn cobs so dry corn cobs um, that uh, once dry and died look like um, snakeskin so a yeah, really interesting way of stabilizing work and sometimes if we've got like a little soft spot, we can use a thin super glue or something like that. Absolutely. A, yeah, yeah. Thin one. super glue. Sanding sealer, uh, sim, thin super glue for pens. Um, sanding sealer for this sort of project. Um, you can get um, wood stabilizers as well, um, but I guess you'd have to be pretty careful on how you then turn them afterwards. Um, the other option, you know. And then Scott's asking, um, please, can you explain why you started the beading at the widest part versus ensuring you have a full bead at the rim? Um, well, it would be easier for me to end on that full bead, uh, full bead by cutting with the parting tool, because whatever happens, you're going to have a half bead at one end. So by starting here, nice and easy, I can then work my way out around the top over and just trim back to my last full bead makes it easier for me so i don't have to worry about anything all right little wire brush just take out any nasties not that there were much on this one and then i'm gonna just give a little bit of a going over with web rats this is your sort of scotch bright equivalent so it's an abrasive all right just to take away any fluffy areas and then i'm going to go over it again with sanding sealer All right, just to make it as stable as physically possible. There we go. Wipe off. I can now. I can wipe off the excess because I've done a lot of the work for the the beading. All right, I'm going to stand to one side. Get rid of that excess sealer. Just using that centrifugal force to get rid of any excess. But you'd be careful about that. I'm doing it because I'm in a bit of a rush to get this out for you. Um, just let it dry normally at home. There. So that's prepped and ready for our first set of um, our first set of lines. So we're going to do the rotary lines first, and we're going to do those with uh, a wire burner. Um, I'm going to keep the speed the same. Do be a little bit aware of what you've got in your hands here. There's two things. First of all, it's a wire. Okay, don't be sloppy with this one. Um, basically, you know, when you hold it, control it. Don't be dangling it around anywhere with a lathe spinning and all those sorts of things. You do need to have some, um, you know, presence of mind here. You need to be aware of what you're doing. Um, and you're only doing this, you're not wrapping it around or anything. Don't try and, and do this to get a burn. It, you know, it will take it out your hands and it'll wrap your knuckles at best. Okay. Um, and the other thing, once you've done this once, don't pick your wire up. Don't do that because you'll have a horrible burn running right the way through your fingers in your hand. Um, so it will get red hot. So just be aware. So nice firm grip and hold that's all we're doing we are holding and waiting for that sudden push okay we've got a nice black mark coming up there i'm going to do that in fact i'm going to turn the dust extractor on just in case i set off all the fire alarms i won't be popular um, with management so there we are and we're going to work our way through
watch everything that you're wearing. I always wear no sleeves, no baggy jumpers, those sorts of things. Look how close your arm will get. Just be aware of things. And once we've done this, we're just going to again go over with some of that web racks. Well, these lines up here they're not they're harder to do but you can still get in there you can see how that wire finds its own little way in the only thing you can't do with them is do a concave line we can use a pen or a pencil to do that afterwards so I am now carefully going to put that down, not in the shavings. Okay, I'm going to put it on my bench, away from any potential fire. Well, that is the fire hazard, away from any um, sources of ignition, fuels and things like that. So there we are. Let's turn that, that off a minute. So I can put my tool rest to one side. So that's what we've got. Those, those are our uh, radial lines. So now we just need to divide those up into vertical lines. Now for that, we're going to use um, our indexing on the lathe. But I need to find a way of, of holding my, my pyrography pen, which we're, we're going to use here. I've got a nice pyrography pen. Ben has made me a nice sharp tip for this one. Again, if I do this, you should see. But if I turn them over, you can see that it's knife-like. Um, in its in its uh, profile. So the beauty of this pen that I've got here, I've got a nice little flat area on the bottom that I'm going to run along my platform. Um, but if you haven't, then just make one. You know, make a little wooden holder for your pen that you can then run along the platform. I'll show you exactly what I mean. The pen's not on at the moment, so there's no heat from that pen. I'm going to use my my sanding platform, which is used for so many things. I think, I'm just going to momentarily take my tailstock out of the way because I think I've set this up already. Let me just double check. And what I'm going to check for here is that my pen tip, we're almost there. I just need to, let's have a look. I need to be on center. So just a wee bit more. There we are. That is now meaning. I don't know whether that was in shot then when I done that. But now when I put my pen down, I'm actually going to have the nib of my pen on the center line of the lathe. Okay, that's that's really important. Otherwise, what happens is as we cut along here or as we burn along here, the line goes up high on the smaller um, diameters. Okay, so it has to cut that center line all of the way. We will have the tail sort just because, again, just because we can. Um, and look where I am with the with the platform. I want to be able to run this pen all the way along. So just double check before you start that you can do that all the way around to the top. Okay, let's turn the pen on and use my first index position. In fact, before we do that, I'm going to stop the writer. Now, what I haven't shown you i'm going to have to very quickly just change this camera been in danger of messing everything up very briefly there we are that's good um now let's have a look you can just see a little bit of yellow tape here now i've pre uh, marked this yes i've got an indexing um uh, stop lock on my lathe there are numbers on the tail stock of my lathe I don't want to be looking at the tail stock. I want, uh, sorry, the hand wheel on the left of my leg. I want to be looking at the business end. So I've just put a little bit of masking tape on this area. I've then gone through each of the index positions and marked it with pen on there. So I can quickly and easily see it. 
at the business end. So what I'm going to do is find my first position. So take that out. I don't know what I'm doing that for. Find my first position. Screw in my index thing. There. So that's my first position. Everything's locked up. I'm in the indexing uh, point. Now I'm going to do my first um, cut, and then we can move on and do the other 36 in this case. Now, it, this isn't a quick process. Let's turn a bit more heat up. This isn't a quick process, so settle in for this. It's going to take you a while. Um, for that reason, I'm only going to do a few. And I want to make sure I get good coverage. So let's do four or five. Take your time. Don't let the pen ride. So don't let it sort of like tram line. You want to not follow the grain with that cutter. You want to create your line. So taking my time. I'll show the camera in a minute. And you can use this this little technique for, for many things in decorating. And look, I've just gone right over the top of that bead at, at the very top. It just looks a little bit nicer when it comes when you come to decorate it. Uh, if you go all the way over the top, so the bead looks as though it's formed all the way around. Look. Uh, now, let me just take that first index position out. I'll do like I said, I'll do four or five, so it's, you can get an idea of where we're going. But that gives us a really really nice straight line at the top. Okay. Um, and try where possible to keep um, keep your line the same thickness as well. So let's do the next one. Oh, that's the same one. Let me just recut. There we are. That's good. Next one. So two of 36. And just having those, those little lines there in your eyesight just really helps. So just moving nice and slow, letting the pen do the work. And up the top. Not forgetting, come around that front face. Have a line. Concentrating on keeping that pen nice and flat on the sanding table. So this is number three of 36 to give you an idea of the sort of time involved. Four of 36. Got a gentleman with Turner here, Cohen, saying yeah, you know, how, many, <laughs> <laughs> how many times out of 36 do you think you'll slip and touch the Bernie bit with your finger? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying nothing until I finish. There, I'm going to do one more. Right, one more. Last one. When I first started playing with these, instead of burning here, and I'm going to show you an example in a minute because it made Ben laugh, um, instead of doing what I'm doing, I don't know why. Again, I, I've spoken about overthinking things a lot. Um and that is exactly what I was overthinking it. So I thought, instead of burning straight off, let's use a pencil and, and scribe vertical lines up through it. And then I'll sit down with the pyrography pen and 
burn those lines in. Well, that's fine if you're an amazing um, artist or you've got an extremely steady hand. I was shaking all over the place. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let me just show you. You might giggle. There was my attempt at, attempt at a nice straight line. So for me, didn't work very well, actually. Um, so that's why I've gone this route. Much easier. Look, that's enough. I'm going to put my pen down. And we'll have a look at those, those lines. So that is, how many is that? So five of 36. Okay, so by the time you go all the way around, you'll end up, you'll end up, um, with all the lines that way. That gives you your little areas for you to color in. Um, in terms of coloring in, yeah, but let's do these questions first, Ben. Yes. Um, so a question here from uh, Dances with Aardvarks. Have you done any other type of basket weave other than the Navajo style? Um, no, we had a nice, we had a go at sort of contemporary sort of basket. We passed that one over, Ben. We, there's that one on the shelf there oh, if yeah. you can reach it. So this is what we've done a few a few months ago now it's before christmas i think um and this was just playing around with a this was a bigger bead this one look um and again should we put the on the number two that was quite a nice little sort of contemporary spiral i guess it was all yeah sort of little spiral that was good fun um that was work, myself and ben working together obviously much bigger beads in this one um i was actually using bead forming tool crown bead forming tool on this much bigger so that's about eight mil um i think that one but yeah you you then have to work with your divisions so um it takes a little bit of planning that you sort of got counting and need a little bit of math to decide where you're going to go like i say there's lots of really cool um inspiration on the internet that, that, that you can look at um to find out exactly where where we go with that and then we've got a question here from andy um a, a totally off topic he says but um could you perhaps make a download for your offset pendant um how deep the cut how deep you cut into the chuck plates for holding what size drill used and what offset or thick yeah. but i think all that info's it is i can quickly give you it i mean the offset was 10 mil on mine 50 mil pendants 10 mil offset um yeah in terms of depth we're talking about two to three mil into in the depth of uh, of both the wood plate and the nylon um but the nylon don't forget that was drilled instead of turn so that was on a pillar drill and step drilled so three different drill bits starting with a large one middle size then small um at about two to three mil per per um for a drill bit all right but yeah have a look back at the video I, I hopefully i've answered loads of stuff if there's something that you're unsure about email me i'll just see, ping it uh, back to you um so mike b's asking um if you fashioned the pen knob as a flattened loop instead of a point would that make for a smoother path with the pen instead of having to stop and change direction. It probably would. The only thing there is that you can't get to the bottom of the bead, the V cut of the bead. So that's what that's where I started. And then um, that's why we went and sharpened and pointed uh, the, 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 the nib, just to get that, that little V at the bottom of the beads. That was the only thing. So you meant um, nib. Yeah, I, I knew what you meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've known you for a long time, man. I knew what you meant. Um, Go for it, yes. Um, sorry, Cohen. Uh, uh, Wood Turner bloke, he's asking, what do you use for the colouring? For the colouring? For the colouring in? Mm -hmm. uh, these. So these are little fine nibs, fine nib pens, and I've just bought these over the internet or go into your, uh, you know, store... And I just literally asked for a fine nib, a felt tip, as opposed to a regular ballpoint. Um, and then just, yeah, just sit there and color, sit there and have fun. On the 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 um, the one eighth beads, it has to be really really fine. Like I was saying, if you go to three eight, then you can use the Chromacraft pens. They're 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 nicely pointed for that this very thing. 
Oh, ben smiling. The, uh, <laughs> sorry, the, the gentleman with Turner's, um, he's saying, if you've messed up drilling the soft drilling the soft jaws, can you turn off a new face and drill again? He's yeah. asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. That friend has, an, has had an accident, has he, Mark? Um, <laughs> yes, no problem. Of course, you can just clean off that face. And then likewise, also... Um, they wear after a while. If you've made a few of those, you know, you're going to find that with sanding and things like that, or the odd, not that you would mark the odd catch here and there, um, then you're going to start, uh, you know, wearing them away. So what you might have to do is just skim the surface and start again. That's the beauty of them. The same with wood plate jaws. Um, you can start again. You could completely start again by taking the wood plate off if you wanted to. So yeah, they loads and loads of options um, with those. And there we are. So I'm not going to, don't worry. Um, the last one of these I done took about two hours. So I'm not going to um, sit here, sorry, stand here and make you uh, watch that. Let's just do that last little square there just to give you an idea of where we are. And I wasn't joking about sitting in front of the telly box um, <laughs> and doing this. It's exactly what I've done in front of, uh, oh, I can't even remember what I was watching now because I was too engrossed in my colouring in, I think. Um, give it time spend um spend a decent amount of time on it if you like me i have to put my glasses on sit under a nice strong light and just color away okay um do it when once you've done the vertical lines the, the radial lines vertical lines you're going to then do the next bit you're not going to color in until this is off the lathe so just just to let you know that so we actually get to um the position of having all your lines in both uh, radial and vertical and then we're going to go on to this next step which is um just hollowing well not hollowing but fluting drilling and parting then you sit in front of your tv doing the coloring yes ben well i'm going to answer a question whilst i'm just walking across there to get a drill bit sure um <clears throat> so uh wood turner bloke he's saying when is colwyn going to do a video of the pippi u blank he gave you at harrogate on the what Pippi U oh, blank. Oh, the Pippi U blank. I remember that. Right. Well, I think it <laughs> has to be then, doesn't it? We have to now. Um, I'm away for all the next probably four or five weeks, but then um, we'll we'll do something in probably May June. How's about that? What was that tag so I know for next time? Wood Turner Blake. Wood Turner Blake. Right. Okay. <clears throat> yes, let's do that. Major and Ben, can you remind me? When I'm we finish? fairly sure. Was that the gentleman who came on the Windsor chair course? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, Cohen, we've got a couple other questions uh, from Ken. This one: Is it better to color light to dark or dark to light? Light to dark all the time. You imagine trying to, if you had a dark bit of timber, trying to um, put a light die finish whatever on that uh mark i've just burnt myself on the pen so there we are i didn't take that long did it around my wrist just didn't turn the pen off um right drill chuck uh, how are we doing for the minute ben question wise uh just skimming through uh would turn a bloke martin that's it yeah that's the one. um so yeah no that's it for now oh sorry is one in from fuller um, uh, good question. Do any finishes cause the colours to bleed? That is a brilliant question. And we had this. Um, so someone was asking, I can't remember where I was demonstrating it, but this very question, absolutely. So if you wipe a finish on, especially something like a sanding sealer or a lacquer, you will wipe, in most cases, you'll wipe those pens off um, and they'll bleed into each other and be horrible. Um so spray lacquer, spray um, sealer, spray lacquer. Um, don't wipe it on or off. That, that's the, a good question. Yes. Right, I'm just going to move this. I'm going to swing my um, bowl gouge around, and I don't want to catch that tail stock. So nice, quick section. Let's just double check the chuck grip. Small bowl gouge. I'm just going to do a little, a little cut. with the bowl gouge. Not gonna go silly. It's 
So all I'm doing is fluting in the top of the bars. Enough to make a nice little entry way for the drill bit. So we've done that. Now the drill chuck can go in. It's going to lead into that center really nicely now. Drop my torus out of the way. Lace piece going down. I want to be drilling here about, about 14 to 16. It's about right on this bit. Um, and this is a grass pot. We're not, no liquid in this one. And we're not putting bunches of flowers in. This is little, little grass pot. All right. We don't want that noise. My hand, I don't know whether, you, whether that's visible anywhere, Ben. My hand, no, it's not. Go to camera one. My hand has not left the drill chuck. So whilst I'm pu pushing that in, pulling it out, I've got a hand on the drill chuck. I don't want to be just doing this and then suddenly find that drill chuck spinning around under a mile an hour and flying off somewhere. So I've just kept my hand there to stop that from happening. All right. It, you know, worst case scenario, you, you detect it when it starts to slip. So you stop your actions, you know what I mean? Um, so that's that's the reason my hand was there all the time. Yes, Ben? Um, just a quick apology to Martin. I missed your question there, but I think we answered it. Um, a need to fix the colour before you finish it, but um, I think you've been through that, Colin. Yeah. Um, and then does, uh, could a bit of wax on the drill bit stop the noise? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Now I can finish this little flute. And we are a little finishing cut. Pop that away. Just, just because. Let me pop a little pencil line in there. But you want to go with your permanent marker just to do the internal line. You won't see that otherwise. I'll just stop the lathe and show you what I mean. So this top line, um, it won't be seen. You can't get your, your wire burner in there. So a little permanent marker. And you can see the lines coming around at the top now. Um, so let's say you've done all your vertical lines and your radial lines. You've done your inside and you've sanded the inside, and then the next stage for you is to part off. So back to the parting tool. Lay speed down to about 1,400 revs, red, revs in my case. But be confident and comfortable with this. You know, if you feel that that's a bit too fast for you, turn the lay speed down. A very slight dish to the underside as well, just a slight one. Left hand comes over, or right hand, depending on what hand you are. Support gently, cut gently. Watch what you're wearing on your arm. Make sure nothing's going to get bound up in the lathe. Stop the lathe. I'm just going to pinch the bottom of that that waste away, but I would now naturally go to um, a rotary sander in the lathe just to clean that bottom up. A little bit of sanding sealer on there. There, that's that one. All finished. So that would, remember, you would have done all your vertical lines. You can now take that indoors and start colouring away. So hopefully end up with something similar or close to that version.
all right? I mean, a fun little project. And we've there, we've turned a vase there, okay? Imagine little collectible bottle stoppers, jewellery, like the, we were just talking pendants, but doing pendants like that, bottle stoppers like that, light pools like that, um, a lamp, for instance. You know, you can have some real fun with this, and you can decorate it to whatever uh, theme you wanted to. I've even seen pots, um, it's some uh, food for thought for you, um, with Mario Brother scene on it. You know, so there's, you don't have to stay um, to sort of uh, the cultural uh, basket weave. You can go really retro, really um, sort of uh, modern and um, and game if you want to. Yes, Ben, a few more questions. Um, so a question here from Andy, uh, going back to the pendants. Yes. Um, the uh, drill, size of the drill bit uh, the uh, for the hole in the pendant. Uh, so, oh, it doesn't really matter, but I used it. It was about eight mil. Um, if you say six to eight mil, um, then that should be enough. It Really, it's just so you don't suddenly explode through the piece um, and break out the backside. That, that's it, really. Uh, it's also a good way of being able to center up when you when you turn it, turn it over. You can see that hole running through. It gives you a, a line of sight. So, yeah. And then a question here from Malcolm. He's saying, if you were to hollow it out completely, would you do that prior to burning and coloring or after? Oh, prior. Yeah, I mean, and then what you could do, if you wanted to hollow it out completely, save going through that tiny little hole in there, why don't you create a join and disguise it with one of the beads? You could just literally do it in two halves. Um, so a great way of completely hollowing it out. More questions? That's it. Excellent. Well, look, thanks, everybody, for all those questions. They're really good. I'm really, uh, you know, this, this is a, a really cool project, a nice project, because... Like I said earlier, you don't have to stick to a vase shape, a bowl shape. We've seen all the, all of those. Um, do something different. Do something, like I said, I'm just looking at the shelf behind me over here, in front of me. Salt and pepper grinders, you know, lamps, um, all sorts of things you can you could basket weave uh, with. And, and you don't have to stick to the sort of colors that I'm giving you here. Um, so there's lots to think about. I think we've got one more question. Yep. Sorry, Colin, one I missed. Um, does this work on all types of wood? No, it doesn't. No, the denser, the better. Um, and again, think about creating a canvas. So the paler timber is the better as well. If you want to put color on, then go pale. If you don't, if, you know, if you want to just maybe put blacks on, um, then you can darken the timbers up. Not you know, It's not so much of a problem. But if you want to create a color palette, then white is better. So uh, maple, good hard maple, um, good hard sycamore. Um, I've got some birch there, which is working well, a little bit woolly, but working well. Holly is a great one. You know, those sorts of things, they're the ones that really, really work. All right. I think we've exhausted the questions for the minute. Excellent. Well, look, um, Ben's uh, going to be demonstrating for you on Thursday. Uh, unfortunately, not live. He's going to be um, a, 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 his former self, a recorded self, um, doing the Celtic Knot Pen, um, which is a really interesting one, actually. I... I it was a bit of a mystery on how to create that Celtic knot in a pen um, for ages until Ben finally showed me. So join, join Ben the pen on Thursday. He's going to be doing our, the Celtic knot pen. Um, but thank you ever so much, everybody, for stopping by and, and spending the last hour with me. It doesn't uh, doesn't escape me that, that you, you've sat down and given me your time. So if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to do that. It really does help. Um, and subscribe and share us around as much as you can. And until next time... Um, uh, bye bye. Thank you very much, everybody.